My name is Kevin Carey. I'm the director of the education policy program here at the New America Foundation. And on behalf of uh, the entire foundation, let me say welcome and thank you so much for joining us uh, this morning for what I know is going to be a fantastic discussion uh, about really one of the central challenges to education policymaking today. Um, as you all know, there's been an intense interest uh, in recent years about the question of teachers and their effectiveness in the classroom, their ability to help students learn. Um, that interest is born out of a lot of econometric research suggesting the, both the uh, tremendous importance of teachers in helping student learning, and also, but also the tremendous variance amongst teachers. And I think it's really that sense of variance that has driven a lot of these research and policy questions. Um, we want to know uh, which of our teachers are succeeding the most, are succeeding the least, how much distance there is between them, and what we should do to act on that information once we have it. A, a lot of the debates around teacher evaluation um, can be, I think, categorized in, in one, of two, one of two things. Partly, we think a lot about how we should evaluate teachers, and a lot of that debate is centered around standardized test scores, which have this kind of magnetic attraction in the debate in uh, pre-K through 12 education uh, because of their controversy, because of the way they're integrated into our accountability systems. And then the other part of the debate has been around what should we do with information um, about teacher performance? Should we use it uh, for selection? Should we use it for professional development? Should we use it for pre-service training? Um, some combination of all of the above. Um, and how do we find out more about uh, teacher performance outside of sort of the realm of test scores? But there's really been, I think, um, an inattention in this whole debate to the uh, many, many parts of our public education system that are, sit outside of uh, this central debate and controversy over accountability, and particularly in the early grades. Um, and this is despite the, the fact that uh, the evidence uh, showing the importance of teacher, teacher quality is as strong or stronger for young children um, than it is for anyone. Um, and so it's one of these things where, because we're you know, really not quite sure what to do in earlier grades when we don't have uh, standardized tests just kind of spitting out scores that we can run through algorithms, people have uh, you know, not thought about it as much as, as perhaps they ought to. Um, and that's really the reason that uh, Laura Bornfreund, our senior policy analyst, decided to tackle this very big and very important issue and really find out what's going on um, in the states that have uh, for a variety of either legislative or policy reasons, decided to go ahead uh, with this process of evaluating teachers in all grades, including the earliest grades. Um, and what, what she found, I think, is fascinating. Um, fascinating sometimes in really interesting ways. Fascinating sometimes in, oh my God, I can't believe they're doing that kind of ways. Um, but really speaks to, I think, again, what is one of the, the central policy challenges um, in education going forward. We had a little confusion when the first report came out. We had some people emailing us wanting to know Laura's opinions about the degradation of the great coral reef outside of Australia um, due to the title um, Oceans of Unknown. So we had to clear that up. Um, this is, and if, if you have come here um, uh, with a background in oceanography, I encourage you to stay. You'll learn something. Um, uh, it's always good to kind of think outside your field. Um, and if you're here to learn more about uh, teacher evaluation in the early grades, then I think you're in for a treat. So with that, uh, Laura Boynfreud. Good morning, and thank you, Kevin. And that's actually true. I did receive questions about oceanography, so. <laughs> Very, very true. Um, my recent paper, An Ocean of Unknowns, explores how states and school districts are or are planning to use student achievement data to evaluate pre-K and early grade teachers. I looked at five states and three school districts, Colorado, Delaware, Florida, Rhode Island and Tennessee, and Austin, Texas, Hillsborough County, Florida, and Washington, DC. Today I'll briefly discuss what has led to the overhaul of teacher evaluation systems and highlight 
what makes the use of, that's helpful, <laughs> um, what, what makes the use of achievement data in the early grades so complex? Then I'll briefly explain the approaches being used and delve into the opportunities and risks in one of those approaches. And finally, I'll share three big recommendations that I make in the paper and um, as well as to hi highlight some key considerations I discuss. Okay, so let's get started with just the, the big picture. Um, no Child Left Behind gave us the high, highly qualified teacher provision, and some critics really said that the focus should not be on teacher credentials of degrees and, um, you know, passing scores on certification exams as um, was outlined in the highly qualified teacher provision, but instead um, the focus should be on teacher effectiveness as measured in part by student learning outcomes. And in 2009, the new teacher project released the Widget Report, which really helped shine a light on the poor state of teacher evaluation, finding that this, these systems provide very little information uh, to help differentiate teachers, for one, or to help teachers improve their practice or instruction. Later that year, the Obama administration announced its Race to the Top grant program requiring interested states to reform their teacher evaluation systems to incorporate multiple measures of teacher performance. And multiple measures, you know, in could incorporate a lot of things, but they should include observations of actual teaching. And in a previous paper, we actually um, talk about that and stress that, and the paper was watching teachers work. And one of the most controversial multiple measures that, that is being required is this focus on student growth. And, you know, by the way, at the time, there was $4 billion available um, during a time when states really needed the money. So this, this became a real focus. Um, and, you know, it definitely should be a focus, but it, it sort of forced states to kind of think about it um, pretty quickly. As of 2012, uh, more than 20 states have passed new teacher evaluation laws, at least, and even more have made some changes through regulation. And then reinforcing the focus on teacher evaluation reform and this focus on student growth in all grades, uh, the administration made it part of flexibility waivers from uh, some of the most unpopular and unrealistic provisions of No Child Left Behind. So most states now have been granted a waiver, and just about every state is really grappling with this issue. And, you know, measuring student learning in the untested grades and subjects, and, you know, those can be just quick reference, those could be arts, you know, music, um, science in high school, but I'm focusing really on the pre-K through third grades, which I think haven't gotten as much attention. And, and we know that third grade is part of state testing programs, but when students enter uh, third grade, there's, there's not, you know, a previous year of information. So they're often um, considered, third graders are often considered in untested as well. So, okay. So let's take a closer look at what makes pre-K through third grades a little bit more complex. First, children's development is directly linked to their academic growth. Uh, teachers are crucial for helping to lay the foundation for children's literacy and numeracy, as well as general knowledge and social emotional skills and executive function, which refers to things like uh, you know, working with others, taking turns, persisting on a challenging task, things that we know are really important to students' success throughout their schooling and of course in life. So so measures of children's growth used to judge a teacher's impact on learning should be based more on than just reading and math. Measures need to look at other domains of learning. Second, it's more difficult to obtain reliable and valid assessment data from young children. One time paper and pencil tests with or without the bubble sheets won't work. Uh, their attention spans are short and um, you know sometimes a skill they were proud of one to show off one day they're, they'll withhold the next. Third, some assessments often look at very basic skills, and we don't want teachers to narrow student learning to simply a limited range of basic skills like, say, letter identification in pre-K or kindergarten, which you know, some of the assessments being used are just looking at those narrow, narrow skills, which of course are important, but they're not providing that, that big picture. And then fourth, um, different delivery models and dosage in pre-K and kindergarten. This pre-K delivery really varies state to state. Some programs are half day and some are full. Um, this is true in kindergarten also. 
Some pre-K teachers are required to have bachelor's degrees and licenses, others are not. Ratios are typically lower in pre-K and often kindergarten classrooms too. And some programs use co-teachers, so states and districts really need to think through uh, what this means and how to account for some of these, all of these variations. So there are, there are primarily three approaches that I found being used right now um, across states to measure student learning growth for the purposes of teacher evaluation. And these are specifically, they're being used in, in some of the other untested grades but um, and subject areas, but specifically for the pre-K through third grades. First is student learning objectives. And if you haven't heard about SLOs, this is, there's three components. First, a measurable goal or objective for a teacher's students. A growth target that is set with baseline data um, from on student you know, performance in, in mind. So teachers are thinking about you know, where their students are in, in when they enter the school year. And then an assessment or another tool to measure the student's progress toward the objective. And this seems to be the method that is really taking hold across the states. And there are districts in at least 20 states that are implementing SLOs right now. And there's some examples of states up there, Colorado, Connecticut, Delaware, Georgia, um, Indiana, New Hampshire, and, and a few others. And then the second method is new and shared assessments. And you know these could be assessments already being used in the classroom for some students, so they're not part of the regular um, state standardized testing program, but they could be you know assessments that you know the district is requiring or the, the state is requiring on another on another level for teachers to already be using. Um, but they're used for another purpose, either diagnostic or um, you know really to 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 be used for instruction, they're, f they're formative kinds of assessments, um, or these could be brand new assessments that are created by the district or the state. And then the third is this idea of shared attribution, which is really attributing the learning of a, one set of students to another teacher. Uh, for example, basing a kindergarten teacher's growth rating f um, on third grade reading scores. Okay, so looking closer at student learning objectives. See several opportunities with SLOs, which I'm going to talk about, and then we'll look at the, the other side of um, SLOs. Largely, SLOs are teacher-driven and can foster collaboration and shared priorities. In Austin, for example, teachers have to write an SLO for their individual classroom as well as work on a team SLO, so with their grade level team. Um, first grade teachers, for example, come together to discuss, discuss appropriate objectives for their students as well as a way to measure the progress toward that objective and, and you know, they work together to develop the target as well. As SLOs also have the potential for improving instruction and for helping teachers to better meet students' individual needs because I think the, the process alone really could make it easier for teachers to understand where their students are at the beginning of the year, um, setting that, that goal of where they should be and thinking about how to get them there. And good teachers will tailor their instruction appropriately and check in throughout the year to make sure things are going according to plan. Also, SLOs really could be the best of supporting a more well-rounded curriculum as opposed to, to narrowing it simply because it's, um, you know, it's not limited to what's being, what's being you know, tested requiring you know, under a, a specific testing program. It, it opens um, the opportunities for teachers to think more, more broadly and principals to you know, develop more broad priorities around what um, those objectives should be for students. So they, they could, they're some, in some places, teachers could come up with, you know, f four, five, maybe even more SLOs. Um, you know, it depends on districts. Some places are just requiring, you know, one or two. So those could be narrower, but I think there's some opportunity there for more well-rounded, well um, more rounded, well-rounded look at what students are doing as well as um, teachers, teachers' impact on their learning. And then finally, I think, you know, there's, there's the likelihood that these are more supported by teachers because the data, one reason is the data could be more immediately relevant to their lesson planning and instruction throughout the year. So I think there are many benefits of SLOs as a way to help teachers think more deeply about what their students know um, and are able to do throughout the year and, you know, as I said, how to get them there. I think there, at the same time, there's some risks that we can't overlook. First, 
SLOs are resource intensive um, and require new or expanded expertise at both the district and school level. To do SLOs well, school districts need to set up a review process of some sort. And in Austin and DC, this meant dedicated staff, uh, de dedicated district staff, and in some cases, um, in other places, school staff as well. Principals and teachers also need professional development on what a high quality SLO looks like, how to craft those good objectives, rigorous but attainable targets, and how to select or create an appropriate assessment rubric or other measure to you know, really see if, if the progress is being made. Also, uh, there's an inability or little way to compare teachers. So using SLOs, diff teachers are using, um, excuse me, teachers using SLOs um, are developing different objectives and different assessments within a school and across a district. So there's there's nothing, um, you know, it's not a standardized in the same way that a test is. So that that creates some some challenges when you when you think about how to, how do we compare um, what teachers are doing with with students and what kind of progress is being made. Um, and finally. Well, I'll, I'll just give a quick example. Austin has taken some steps to mitigate, um, you know, this this issue by reviewing every single SLO and matching it to uh, to a quality standard. Um, and DC also reviews SLOs for feasibility, which helps to ensure that that you know the targets that are being set are both you know rigorous and realistic. And then in Rhode Island. Um, the state says that it's best practice for teams of teachers to come up with, um, you know, s the same objectives and select the same assessments, but it's not required. It's, um, you know, that decision is ultimately left up to the districts. And then finally, I think, you know, uh, there's, a con there's a concern for potential ma manipulation. And, you know, the question I ask is, is it really appropriate for teachers to play such a significant role in you know, this piece of the evaluation process when they know that the results will be tied to high stakes consequences. But, you know, I think it, it can go either way. You know, teachers may also may be prone to set, you know, more, more complicated or even, you know, more complex um, targets for their students, thinking that, that they can, you know, progress even more than, than is actually possible. So there's, there's concerns on both sides there. So I think that, um, you know, one way that states are thinking about this, this issue with SLOs and, and maybe a way to, to improve things is to bring some uniformity to the process. And, um, you know, so there's, there's a couple places that are doing this. Colorado, for one, has an online assessment bank, and it's available to districts, schools, and teachers. And the assessments in the bank have been reviewed by testing experts and educators for quality using a rubric that that same rubric is also available to districts that want to, you know, find or create their own assessments so they can use and, and measure them against that rubric. Delaware Department of Education brought um, educators together to create a common set of objectives for each grade level and subject area. And then classroom teachers, when they go to um, write their SLO for the year, they, they select from those objectives. And Delaware also has an assessment bank. And Washington, D.C. is considering an assessment bank as well. And Georgia was going with an approach where districts establish the objectives and identify the assessments to be used at specific grade levels. So finally, um, three recommendations, big recommendations that I make are, so account for specific attributes of the pre-K through third grade teachers. What, what's going to work for, you know, a, a seventh grade science teacher isn't necessarily going to work for a first or second grade teacher. And I think that that's, that's an important um, thing that's, that policymakers need to, need to remember. Um, Take the time to pilot and evaluate before adding stakes. Make sure that you know the significant kinks of these systems have been worked out. And then um, use caution with shared attribution measures. But um, you know, I say use caution, but really by this I mean do not use shared attribution from later grades as the sole measure of student growth to evaluate early grade teachers. Because it, it doesn't really provide any useful information about their teaching for, you know, how they're how they're working with the students that are in their classroom, but it also doesn't help them with any information to improve their instruction. So we don't we don't know anything about what's actually happening on the growth side. Um, the observation is a different story. Um, and then some other key considerations. And I just 
want to uh, make the point again that states and, and districts, the, the assessments and their purpose um, matter. So I said a little bit earlier that some places are, are selecting assessments that are already in use, but not necessarily, but they're, they're not for the purpose of teacher evaluation, so, um, or to, to measure teacher effectiveness. So states and districts should really be consulting texting experts to make sure that they can be, that assessments that are being used are valid and reliable for the multiple purposes for which they are being used. Also, capacity. Do states and school districts really have the resources right now and expertise to do SLOs well? And, you know, if, if not, what, what's needed to, to get them there? And then um, pre-K and kindergarten. Oh, I skipped teacher and principal preparation. So I think there's a lot of room um, where for, for growth in teacher and principal preparation programs around how to use data better, how to teach teachers to, to um, you know, look at how students are, are doing from in previous years or even, you know, in, in it, throughout the year in the classroom and using that information um, on a regular basis to change their instruction, to, to make decisions about how to differentiate for, for different kids and, and be able to get them to where they need to be that, that year's growth of learning through <coughs> over the course of the, of the school year. And the same is true for principals. So as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, principals are going to be one level of approval process for the, the student learning objectives. So do they have right now what's needed to be able to approve every single SLO to, to identify what's a, a rigorous objective to know that yes that target is right that you know 80% of your students can move up you know three or four levels depending on whatever what what assessment is being used um, so I, I and and then if it's a teacher created assessment are they able to look at that assessment and know um, whether it's actually a high quality assessment or not and what makes a high quality assessment. So I think that those are some some areas we need to focus on. Again, pre-K and kindergarten teachers, um, you know, there are special circumstances that need to be looked at in those classrooms. Um, the teacher's role in SLOs, as I said before, you know, teachers are highly involved. Um, so we need to think about, um, I think, think about the teacher's role, how to check to make sure that, you know, the, the process is is fair and you know any opportunity for manipulation is is um, you know un intentional or unintentional is low and then finally this issue of research I think you know we always we always hear this but there really is a lack of research about whether any of these approaches are valid measures of a teacher's impact on student learning especially from early grade classrooms there has been some research on the use use of SLOs in Austin Denver and Charlotte um, in tested subjects finding and and links were found between the quality of the growth goal that was set and student achievement as measured by state tests um, but we still have a lot more that we need to know so with that thank you very much Thank you very much, Laura. Hello, everybody. I am Lisa Guernsey. I'm the director of the Early Education Initiative here at the New America Foundation. It's great to see everyone. It's great to see a full room here today on a summer, uh, a summer morning. We are going to move now into a uh, discussion. Uh, there's a, a lot to kind of unpack both within the report that, uh, that Laura's put together, as well as just within the, the small kind of sample that you received here this morning in Laura's presentation. So I'm going to try to moderate our, our discussion among a really fantastic panel that uh, Laura has coordinated here today. I'm just going to take a, a minute or so to introduce everybody. Um, and then we'll launch into a couple of questions, and we should make this as conversational as possible. We've got a good amount of time. It's just about um, 10.30 now, and we just need to clear the room by about 11.30. So we've got some, some good time here for some rich discussion, and I really am looking forward to opening it up to the, the room um, as well. So um, you've heard from Laura, our senior policy analyst here. To her left is um, Kate McMahon, who is the director of the IMPACT, which is DCPS, is the District of Columbia Public Schools evaluation system for all school-based employees. Um, of course, most folks are focused on the teacher part of that. 
that, but it will be interesting to, to, to see if we want to go broader than that or discussion, particularly as we talk about principles. Um, to, to Kate's left is Sandy Jacobs, who is Vice President and Manning Direct, Managing Director for State Policy at the National Council on Teacher Quality. And uh, we're really happy to have Sandy with us here today. Um, and then um, to her left, Andrew Krugley, who is all the way from Chicago here this morning with us. He's the Director of Education at the Educare Learning Network and the Ounce of Prevention Fund and um, has also a lot of experience as a principal of elementary schools. Um, so it's going to be great to have that perspective. And then um, to my right, Tom Schultz, who is Project Director for Early Childhood Initiatives at the Council of Chief state school officers here in Washington, D.C., and has been a wonderful colleague to us here in the Early Education Initiative um, over several years and helping us work through a lot of the big policy questions that are coming up for these pre-K pre through third grade years. So let's get started. Um, what, I, what I was thinking that we should do is um, spend a, uh, first I want to just maybe reiterate a couple of things that Laura said, and then maybe jump into some of those questions around those SOLs, those student learning objectives. Um, but first, just as a kind of a, a, a quick reminder, so what Laura had laid out in her paper is that states are taking this idea of using student achievement data, and they're taking kind of three different approaches with it. And one is using these, this SL, SLO approach, and um, in that they're kind of it's, it's very customized at, at a at level of the individual teacher in many cases or at the individual school or a team of teachers level where those teachers are deciding um, what kind of assessment they would use and then how they would track growth and what kind of benchmarks they would look at. I just do want to point out the other two approaches that she mentioned at the beginning of her uh, presentation. Um, one is just the idea that states are saying, oh, if we don't have testing data for our younger kids, let's make tests for our younger kids. Let's find a way to standardize that information so that we can make those comparisons that we need across teachers and across districts and across schools. And then the third way is that shared attribution idea. And I, I just want to kind of put a fine point on that, that what, what Laura had been finding is that there were some um, places where because there wasn't enough testing data in those younger grades, they're like, well, we at least have testing data for those third fourth and fifth graders, let's just use some composite of that, and then that kindergarten teacher, you can kind of, you can just be judged on how those third, fourth, and fifth grade teachers are doing. And Laura's recommendation is, eh, that doesn't really help those kindergarten teachers very much. That's not really helping those first grade teachers improve very much. That's not really telling us anything about those kids that that teacher actually had. And so that's where um, that recommendation is coming from. But I think that's also open for discussion, and we should put that on the table here today. So, um, so going back to these, this student learning objective, SLO approach, that first of the three, I'm very curious among all of the panelists here, and so why don't we we'll just kind of go down, the, at least for this first question, just go down the row, um, what your, your take is on that. Um, it does seem like the use of student learning objectives is gaining traction. Laura found it that that was primarily what she was coming across when she was doing her research. Do you agree? Is this where we're headed, especially for these younger grades? And um, what are the, the challenges that you see with this method? So, Kate. Sure. Uh, well, I certainly think that this is where we're headed, um, one of the places that we're headed. Uh, I can say that in DC public schools, for the first uh, three years of our evaluation system, our teachers in tested grades, so those who were receiving value-added scores, did not have SLOs. In DC, we call it Teacher Assessed Student Achievement Data, or TAS. Uh, they didn't have that as a part of their evaluation. Their student achievement measure was simply value-added. Um, and we actually heard from teachers in those tested grades that they wanted um, TAS, and they wanted this SLO process. Um, and so this past year, for the first year, we changed the evaluation system for our teachers with value-added data so that 35% of their evaluation is based on value-added and 15% is based on TAS, or the SLO process. Um, it's also the case that in the first three years of impact, uh, the TAS component was 10% for our teachers who were in the non-tested grades and subjects. This past year, we actually moved that up to 15%. Um, so it's increased a bit for everyone, and now, indeed, everyone has this as a component. So it's certainly a place where DCPS 
is moving. Uh, and I think now what we're really trying to do is to make sure that it is a rigorous, uh, a rigorous measure of teacher practice. And so a lot of the challenges that uh, Laura outlined certainly resonate, and there are things that we are grappling with right now, um, but it's where we want to grapple. Great. Sandy. Yeah, I also agree um, that that this is uh, likely where, where we're headed. I think we're going to see um, more assessments come online, um, hopefully because they serve a student purpose and are also useful for, for teacher, uh, for measuring teacher performance, um, especially as we move into the park and smarter balanced assessments. I think we're going to see new things come on the table, but I think there are always going to be uh, grades and subject areas that are best measured through through SLOs. And, and I really agree with what Kate said about um, th that, you know, you don't want it just for some teachers, you really want it for all teachers. In, in Rhode Island, it's part of the system for every teacher, even if a teacher has uh, standardized test data and that's going to be part of their evaluation, they also uh, set uh, SLOs. Um, I think both in terms of the, the training that's required, making sure people are really able to dig in and um, and write meaningful objectives and know how to do that. And, and you know, the whole culture shift that's associated with, with shifting to these kinds of performance systems, it's really hard to say, well, you're going to learn how to do these the, and set these objectives and track your students this way. But you don't need to because we have another measure to way to measure your performance. It's just a, a, weird, um, a weird message. And I think there are lots of places out there, though, that are only using SLOs uh, for a certain group of teachers and are sort of, you know, there's sort of this sense that it's well it's all we have for you so that's what how we're going to track your performance and I think that's that's a little worrisome um, as we move forward I, I think the the biggest challenge in, in actually implementing and and using SLOs is, is that it's not easy you know saying to to a teacher um, so for your performance evaluation this year you need to sit down and write some goals and then maybe pull out some data from you know your previous performance and and here's the form and fill it out and all, all will be well um, you know it's of course not that simple and I think uh, even the places that that know it's not that simple have found it to be even uh, more challenging that, than they thought just in terms of making sure um, that teachers have the vocabulary to, to talk about um, uh, how they're tracking and measuring student performance and, and I think there are some teachers who, who don't just lack the vocabulary they, they really lack the, the, the knowledge of, of how they're assessing and tracking their skills so there's a whole skill building part of it as well making sure that administrators have, have uh, the knowledge and skill also to help teachers with that part and to know when a teacher has set an objective that either isn't measurable or isn't especially meaningful or isn't really tracking um, things that matter. So, so there, there's a, you know, there's um, these sort of conceptual challenges and making sure we're, we're structuring this correctly and then there's the implementation challenges of doing it well. Andrew, from the point of view of someone who's been running elementary schools, what do you think about the SLO model? Um, well, I have, lots of, I have lots of thoughts. I definitely think it's here to stay, and, and I definitely think that <clears throat> we need to hold teachers accountable for student achievement. Uh, Laura makes a, a really important point on the third page of her paper that most of our teachers are, are rated as excellent, yet 75% of our only 75% of our children are graduating high school. You know, uh, our superintendent would say to us, 98% of our teachers are rated excellent, yet only 50% of our students are passing our state achievement test. And so what are we going to do to change that? So it is, it is, a, very important, it is a very important measure. My I, I have some fears and I have some concerns, and they, they echo Laura's. Um, one is that we start looking that, – that – we're going to look at it too narrowly, and that it's that everything is going to become a high-stakes test, and 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 that every assessment is going to become a high-stakes assessment because it's going to be, it's going to all go back to perf uh, performance evaluations, personnel decisions, and compensation, and I think that that there's a lot of fear on teachers' parts, which. Then gets into the, one of the points that the Laura made about manipulation. Um, are they rigorous? Are administrators really following um, what those what those are or not? Because you don't want to get into drama at your school. Um, 
I think it's it's very important that we also look at other measures in terms of teacher practice, not just SLOs. Um, and and then my fear is what happens to the early childhood? What happens to pre-K? What happens even before pre-K in terms of how are we assessing our very youngest children where we know that it is it is there that if we make a difference with our very youngest children, that we're gonna we're gonna make a difference as those children move forward. And are we how fairly are we going to be able to assess them, be able to assess the the teachers in the early childhood field, pre-kindergarten and kindergarten? Okay, Joseph, she's there. Great. Okay, Tom. All right, so I, 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 I agree with my yeah. colleagues. Uh, I think this is the direction we're moving, and I think building somewhat on Andrew's comments. Um, I think the, the strengths and concerns around SLOs um, depend in, in many respects in how the information is going to be used. So if the main purpose of your teacher evaluation system would be to do individual coaching and mentoring of teachers, I would think you know, having teachers develop SLOs and gather feedback on kind of tailored objectives for their class of students um, might be a pretty good fit. Um, if you're trying to find out whether all the teachers in your school district are implementing a set of research-based teaching practices and you're looking at issues of uniformity, um, I think maybe the SLO method isn't quite as good. Um, third and finally, I think the greatest concern is if you're using the teacher evaluation results for personnel decisions, which in fact is one of the stipulations the Department of Education um, has required in their negotiation of waivers um, for uh, to No Child Left Behind. So in fact, this isn't kind of speculation that, oh, it might be used for personnel evaluations. This is, this is a requirement. So as Laura pointed out, one of the challenges with SLOs is the challenge of comparability of teachers and uniformity. Uh, so I think it, it gives me great concern that SLOs would be the primary method if that da those data are, are going to be used for hiring uh, or firing decisions, um, tenure decisions, compensation decisions. I think uh, that might be a mismatch that will be problematic down the road. So I'm, um, as many of you know who have followed my kind of talks here at New America for a while, I have two little kids, um, <coughs> elementary school, actually one of one who's moving on later, but I understand the elementary school system through the roles, uh, through the eyes of a parent a lot of the times these days, and um, and thinking about teachers um, making decisions, having to kind of well, number one find time, find time for this, but making uh, some sort of judgment call about the assessment that they should use and then measuring and tracking those kids over time and kind of figuring out what those benchmarks should be and um, determining what's going to be a fair benchmark or what's going to be a, quote, easy benchmark that I'll just know all my kids will get to so I can just make sure that we all have a good SLO number. Those are all things that certainly came up in my mind as well as Laura was doing the research on this paper. And um, so what is it going to take, do you think, to, if SLOs are where we're going, what is it going to take to get us past a lot of these challenges that you all have laid out, get us into um, some of these questions that, that I just raised as well about the kinds of training that teachers might need or the kind of time that they might need to understand what they're doing? What, what is it going to take a school district to get there or even a principal uh, and teacher to get there? Um, I'll go back to you. Sure. I would say it, it really does come down to helping principals and teachers know how to select good assessments and how to set good goals. Both of those things are really hard. Um, m to be entirely honest, I think harder than we had thought they were going to be when we rolled out TAS. Um, we hadn't realized that writing a goal that will simply produce one score at the end of the year, let alone worry about the rigor, was going to be so challenging. In our review of 10,000 goals in our first year, half of them uh, would not have necessarily produced one simple score at the end of it. That's just workability. Um, and so I think it is a lot about giving principals and teachers the tools. Um, so I mean, first of all, we need, need assessments. <laughs> uh, but then also how to select the appropriate assessment and how to set a good goal based on real 
baseline data. Um, that's, that's a hard process and it's really time consuming and we ask principals and teachers to do so much uh, already and so figuring out how to really have this be a natural part of uh, their work that is actually enhancing their teaching and is not just in order to comply with an evaluation system but really is enhancing uh, their instruction, that, that training and that preparation I think is key. Yeah, I, I would just echo that entirely. Um, I think the more that we show, there, this is there's an instructional purpose here. It's going to make you a stronger uh, instructor because you're you're tracking what your students are doing because you have uh, you know a clear goal and and benchmarks along the way. And and the more that the training is integrated into that and, and that we use data because it's going to help um, us serve students well and not because, you know, here's a, here's a two-hour workshop in the pre-service week before school starts um, because you have to learn how to write objectives for <coughs> your new teacher evaluation system. Um, you know, that's what we want to, to try to avoid and what I fear is, is what a lot of places are, are doing right now. Um, I think, uh, you know, thinking, well, we make this mistake all over the place, right? Thinking that a two hour workshop, uh, oh, now you're good to go, um, you know, <laughs> without lots of follow up and, and actual direct coaching and let's look at the data together. Um, it seems like, in, especially in the early going, the, the more that we can have, um, uh, both from the school level and then at the grade level, some some at least common discussions, if not common goal setting, um, that you know we're, we're the, the the fifth grade focus this year is math and and within math these specific target areas and um, maybe your students look very different than mine and so our actual goals are going to be different but but we know this is what we're what our goal is going to be connected to um, and and we know what the measure is going to be but 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 it's got to be a, a real process and um, I, I think you know a lot of states mostly having to do um, with their with their race the top grants and, and waivers, um, but not entirely because of those things, have set kind of crazy implementation timelines. You know, to go from zero to 60 in a couple of months is, is really hard. And um, without giving teachers, you know, the time to, to really figure out how to do it well. And, and maybe you mitigate against that by saying, all right, well, look, we are fully implementing this year because, because we are. And, you know, that, that, that's not really um, negotiable, but, but maybe the stakes aren't attached now and, until we can, um, can really figure things out. But, but part of that has to be that there's a process in place that helps teachers learn from, well, maybe we didn't set it quite right this year. Maybe there was a mismatch. In, in the assessments and what we were trying to measure. Maybe, in fact, we couldn't measure it at all, but that there's a way they're getting that feedback so that they're going to know how to do it better next time. If all we find out from our pilots is, ugh, well, everyone, <laughs> everyone kind of messed this up, um, but there isn't a plan of how to address that and, and move forward, then you know, all we're doing is checking our box off that, yes, we had, had a pilot. Um, I, think, I think that we need to teach everyone how to understand the data and how to use the data and how to blend the data because there's so much of it. We, we go on data overload yeah. um, and then we don't know what to do with it and then we just kind of back away from it. Um, so, so for instance, the, the school in which I worked and, and had this opportunity um, the last year that I was there and things have changed dramatically since I left, but we had one target for the whole school, which was every single teacher is gonna have one more student at or above grade level at the end of the year than we did at the beginning of the year. Now that seems like a very easy thing to measure and that seems like something that makes total sense. One more student in the course of three years, we should be able to eliminate all the children that are below grade level. But we have to def then we had to define what is grade level. We had to define what does that mean at, at different for different teachers where there weren't necessarily assessments, art, music, PE, the librarian, for, for instance, um, we had to decide what were the right assessments in each of those places. We had to, so, so we had to decide, is it gonna be a target or is it gonna be a growth model? Are we gonna say we're all gonna hit a target? Um, so I think one of the issues that we have to look at is laying all of this stuff out before we start. Because 
it, on paper, it made sense at the beginning. And like I said, things have changed dramatically since I've left there, and I know that they've made many, many tweaks since I've come to the ounce. Um, but we have to think forward. We have to, we have to really be careful before we put something in place when there's so many questions that are still unanswered. For instance, what one of the, one of the side effects was no one was willing to take a student teacher because how is that going to affect my, my outcome at the end of the year? Well, that's a huge implication for what we're trying to do for our field in terms of improve practice and make better teachers. If, if you're afraid to take on a novice teacher in your classroom and let that person teach because of what is gonna happen with your SLO, whether it be the same SLO for the whole school or an individual one, that, that's something we didn't think about. And, and so all of these things need to be laid out really clearly and really thought through before we start. And I think what's, what everyone is doing is jumping in and moving forward, um, and, and it's scaring people. It's scaring principals, it's scaring, and it's scaring teachers. And, and ultimately, that's going to affect kids. If I can just jump in here then. So I'm curious if you're all in agreement with the one, one of the recommendations Laura had put out, which was to pilot and evaluate first. Is that something that we could all say is a, is a good idea, a good recommendation, or are there tweaks on that? And I, and, and I don't mean to take your time away from this, Tom, but I thought I would just jump in with that question maybe right now. But so, but just, and yeah, take, take a shot at that, Tom, and then anything else you were going to add? So I would say yes, you know, continually evaluate these systems as they're rolling out. I guess I would to add on the question of what the districts need to do. I, I think the directions that Laura outlined of um, moving towards uniformity and creating okay. resources um, so that what what is meant by an SLO is not that each individual teacher in America decides and negotiates with their principal somehow. I don't know how this would work. <laughs> this is my SLO. Um, the other thing, is, it's a larger point, is that I think we've got to do, a, do what we can to line up the incentives and the messages from this teacher evaluation initiative with the other things that we say are important for teachers to do, which to me are you know, progress of students towards college and career you know, standards, certain types of instructional shifts that we think are going to be associated with success for students on that, use of formative assessment data um, as a diagnostic tool. Um, and in terms of the, the quality measures or observational measures that are used to complement the, the student growth data, um, try to have those things be in harmony with the major priorities. And then I think if there, there may be some purpose for individually tailored SLOs, but I think there's needs, there needs to be a common component for uniformity um, rather than something that is um, planned on a, just an individual teacher basis. I just don't see how that's viable. And actually, if I could, Laura, feel free to, to, to jump in here, but we were trying to kind of talk about, well, where are places where they are figuring this stuff out, and they have and have made the most of that kind of time to think through all those steps that Andrew was just describing. Um, and maybe getting to the place of more uniformity is what is what you're seeing. Um, do you want to talk about some of the my brighter spots, perhaps, that you saw? Um, well, I think, I mean, as I, I talked about a little bit in my presentation, I think that Colorado and, and Delaware are some, some places that are really moving toward that, um, that, that uniformity, that you know, teachers can still, in some respects, use the the information that they're getting to you know f direct their their instruction, but that it's also more of a objective sort of sort of measure. So those are those are those are two places that I would would um, point out. But I, I know you know my my look was a little bit narrow, so I know that there's probably other places that that are doing similar kinds of things. I know when I talk to um, uh, somebody from from Impact, uh, S Sam Piercy. He he talked a little bit about DC kind of moving in in some of that direction. So. I'm sure I can speak. To yeah, that. I want to talk a little uh, bit more about Impact because I'm curious about yeah how you over time have sure um, iterations and changes. Right. So I guess in, in response to the to to pilot or not, uh, we didn't. We 
we rolled it out and 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 uh, went with it. Um, that is not to say that we haven't iterated on it every year. So. Um, I think that's actually more important than piloting is really being ready mm -hmm. to take enormous amounts of feedback every year and to make changes. Um, I think that's generally important, but it's also how we've gotten probably the teacher and principal buy-in that we have gotten. They're seeing that their voice is heard as we make changes to the system. Um, so that's just, just a point there. Um, and we are actually now moving towards more standardization. So. Um, between years one and two, we created recommendations, goal recommendations, and assessment recommendations for every grade and subject area. Now, some of those, for example, cosmetology, uh, would have been, we recommend using a teacher-created assessment. Um, so that's not particularly standardized. Um, but for our elementary schools, we recommended using the text and reading comprehension, and we recommended particular targets for that. Um, so we created guidance that we shared with teachers and principals, and they could make decisions uh, to use or to uh, modify or not use that guidance. Um, this coming year, for the first time, actually, we will have mandatory literacy goals hmm. for teachers in particular grades and subjects. The district is um, really focusing in on literacy, and we have aligned to our three reading, uh, I'm sorry, our three literacy focus areas, a particular assessment. And so where those are being used, it will be 50% of their uh, of their final TAS or SLO score. Which which grade are you doing that? We're doing that in, K, in the K through five. K through five grades. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. So there's one. Um, I'm going to ask one last question, then we'll get to everybody in the room. And that is, you know, one unspoken assumption here throughout all of this is that student achievement data and its use in teacher evaluations is here to stay. We're going to be using data on how children are doing and how they're progressing and we're going to be doing that even in those pre-k kindergarten first second and third grades so i just wanted to kind of put that out there to make sure that that you know see where we all s sit on that um do you think that there are some some chances for the debate to turn in different ways uh are there is there a chance that the percentage of which the evaluation um must include achievement data is going to shrink or grow as this debate um, continues. Uh, so wh whoever wants to jump in first on that one. Well, I'll jump in up, but before, I just wanted to say one thing on the, on the piloting versus not piloting. You know, e even if you take external pressure and external forces off the table, like, there's a terrible tension um, that states and districts feel between an urgent need to get teachers um, better feedback about their performance to identify the superstars and, and the chronic underperformers in, in a way that, that we haven't before, and, and, and to do it well. And there's no easy answer to, to that tension at, at all. And um, I think it's easy for for um, wherever someone lands for people to say, well, they, they lean too far towards the urgency side or they lean too far towards the, you know, get everything in place side. And, uh, you know, I, I think there's perfect, a thousand right, right answers to, to, to that. Um, but but the, the key thing is wherever you land on that, that, that there is, a, you know, that there are mechanisms in place to say, well, not this is the system and we're sticking to it, but that, you know, we're continuing to figure out what, what works well, what doesn't work as well and, and how we can move forward. Um, on, on the student achievement data, I mean, I think, you know, be, because we have um, figured a lot of it out as we've dived in, I, I think there are going to be um, adjustments that, that have to be made. You know, we all, um, uh, I don't think anybody would, would uh, disagree that we don't want systems with, with multiple <clears throat> measures, but figuring out the right balance between those multiple measures and, and which actually provide more meaningful data and which provide um, less meaningful data, both in terms of, of validity and reliability and, and um, but also in terms of act how actionable uh, the data is that, that we give back to teachers. So you know, I, we, we don't have the right magic formula. I think that's where we're gonna continue um, to, to see, to see um, you know, tweaks and, and trying different things. Um, at the same time, I think there's a real worry that, um, you know, if, if 
we're five years out and we have 98% of teachers getting an effective <laughs> rating, um, that that's, uh, when we know there's more variability than that in teacher performance, that, you know, that we have a lot of, of unanswered questions. Like there's a big cultural shift that has to happen here. I think that's mostly um, on the um, observation side in, in really giving people the, both the skill to evaluate um, good instruction, but also the, the will and the capacity to be able to sit across from, from a colleague and say, I really thought that lesson I saw today was pretty poor. And I can't, I'm sure Kate could tell <laughs> a thousand stories about how that plays out. Um, but, but also on, on this side, right, it, you know, um, especially where we use SLOs, it's about an administrator being willing to say to that teacher, well, no, this isn't an acceptable, this isn't a rigorous target and we have to rethink it. Or being, you know, and being willing to say, well, the data say you, you didn't meet this target and, and what are the implications of that? There, there's a lot of human elements mm -hmm. for as much as we try to, um, you know, make it a, a more objective system. So um, I, I think we have a, a long way to go, but, um, but, but I, I uh, do think it's it's here to stay for for the foreseeable future. Yeah, I feel like it's a it's a paradox. I did have the reaction, and I think Kevin mentioned as, oh my God, when I read this paper and looked at some of the actual plans that are in place, are, are people seriously you know, carrying out the plans that they are? But I I do think as as Laura pointed out in your introduction, I think it's a step forward to move from just looking at teacher credentials to looking into the question of effectiveness, and I think we should not go back from that. And I do think that, um, as Andrew said, looking at how the kids are doing, it, it's pretty hard to rule that out and say that's not something that we need to grapple with. I think the technical challenges are unbelievable, but I don't think we should go back. And my prediction is that we won't go back to saying that's not what we're gonna um, be including in as a factor. So. I, I agree. I don't. I don't. I don't think it's going away, and I don't think it should. And, and I want to just backtrack. You know, I think what what we did the year that that the year that I did it was the right thing to do. I just think that as we went through it, I saw all the issues that we were going to be presented with in the future, which is what struck me when I read the paper, which is how I got in touch with Laura. I was like, oh my God, you know, I lived part of this. <laughs> and, and, it, and it hit me in that manner because I could see where it was going um, because I do think we made the right move. And, and it was a really difficult thing. And I think that it is here to stay. And, and I agree with your point. It takes a lot of bravery on the part of the administrator because you're going to have teacher pushback, you're going to have teacher union pushback, and as an administrator, you have to stand strong um, to those pressures. But the, the other thing I want to point out that, that, I, that I think we're, we're forgetting is that it's very, very important that we don't turn our schools into little pressure cookers. I know, I know what happens just around state testing time and how much pressure there is for, for our kids and our teachers and even our parents and families around just that two weeks of state testing. And if, if there's going to be so much emphasis put on this that teachers are going to feel, that's going to trickle down to kids, that's going to trickle home. And so however this happens, and it does have to happen, it's got to happen in a way where we keep in mind that we're dealing with little people. We're dealing with very little people and very impressionable little people, and we don't want our our three, four, and five year olds to hate school because they're going to school and it's a pressure cooker, and and so we really, really need to think about that. Absolutely. All right. So any other? Let me open it up. Then um, we'll have a microphone. Um, oh, moving around, and I already see a couple of hands up. Um, so actually, here, yeah. One of our, um, our summer interns, Honey, is going to be coming around with a microphone and we'll take the, this one in the front. And if you could just state your name Hi. and um, sure. your title. I'm Mark Sobolski. I'm a legislative education consultant. I used to work in Arkansas. And I'm glad Mr. Krugley added finally at the end of this discussion the effects that this is going to have on kids because I've seen it before teacher evaluations were even considered, SIG grants were considered. And the intensity of the pressure is overwhelming. The pr 
principals have incredible pressure to create a pure result. Therefore, the little buddies, six and seven year olds, have to stay in their room all morning long and not go to the bathroom. Because who knows, somebody else in another room could be in the bathroom and they could share information, which would taint the entire process now, wouldn't it? Now, I'm going, to a four, I'm going to a four hour discussion tomorrow morning at the Chamber of Commerce. I assure you we'll be allowed to go to the bathroom. <laughs> this intensity, and, and, and no facilitator. able to go on a field trip. <laughs> yeah, there you go. No facilitator was even allowed to point out what page the test was on. And they were thrown out of the building immediately. Suspended so can you get to a, a four question, weeks. Please, just Do you think this is a good idea? <laughs> because this is already being played out and told upon the kids. Because that's what's going to happen, especially if teachers now are going to be evaluated even 10% based on this. And he's not thank, leading thank the you. listeners. He wants thank you to you. know. <laughs> what do you know? What do you think? <laughs> No. So this is yeah, it's the elephant in the room, and and I think it's an important. I mean, it's a part of that data question that we just had at the very end. You know, how we're going to use it if if it's here to stay. Um, any of you like to just kind of tackle it? Goes to that pressure cooker point. Go this a little I, further. I mean, it, again, it's it's balancing competing needs where where there's no one right answer right I, I don't I don't want six and seven year olds to to feel so pressured or, or that their their teachers job depends on on their performance on a test or that their school building closing um, depends on their performance on a test right and I don't think anybody feels comfortable uh, with that scenario at the other end is I don't feel comfortable with a six or seven year old getting a bad education that, uh, you know, is, is impossible to recover from if they have a poor teacher several years in a row or in a, a school, you know, that's been low functioning for years. So we, we, we have to, uh, what you're saying is, is a, a real concern. I don't think, um, you know, we, we can disregard it. But again, it's, it's, it's figuring out how to find the best balances of, of these competing things so that kids ultimately benefit. If you were a practitioner, so, wouldn't, would, don't you think that would have an effect on you on a day-by-day -day basis, not just on testing, but on okay. a day-by-day -day basis? Um, I mean, yes and no. I think, I, you know, I think ten, when we when we talk to teachers in Tennessee, right, Tennessee was one of the first states to implement uh, statewide. And the first year, the, the newspapers were filled with stories. Every place you went, there were stories of, of teachers, you know, throwing up, be, uh, the teachers throwing up on test day, let alone the, the kids. And, you know, in the emergency room. And and um, then, then the second year, there is... Uh, which, which is this school year that, that just ended, they'll be going into their third year, there were way less of those stories. I mean, so much of the, it's, it's more fear of the unknown and, uh, than fear of what it, what it really is once you see it. So I, I think we, we have to get past some of these, these hurdles and, and work our way through them. You know, um, uh, right, I, I, I taught for a long time. We, we did a ridiculous amount of, of test prep. Um, and that that put pressure on on the kids around the test and you did as a teacher you know you did what you could to to mitigate that um, we, we we have to be able to to move forward you know when when um, that that schools are putting you know that it's a leadership problem when that 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 six hours of a day is required to be spent you know on on test prep that that's it, we, we can do things uh, about these things and move forward. I think it's also important to note that even if we were using the old method where, where the principal is just going in and just observing practice, there would be teachers who would throw up or get sick that day too yeah. because that's a scary pressure-filled thing for the teacher as well. So, so I think that that's important to note because just, just that – you know, what you said is we want to make sure that all of our kids are getting the best education that they can. And I do think that we need to blend these two things together. And, and Lisa, you wrote a beautiful paper on, 
on teacher evaluation and 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 on the, the observation, on the observation, observation piece of, of it. teachers. And I think and I think that the, the blending of those two things is very, very important because we need to look at teacher practice as well as student outcomes. I think we need to look at both of those things together. But in looking at just teacher practice, teachers get sick and freak out too. Yeah, I, I would agree with both Sandy and Andrew. And I think that that it's it's why it's so important to for the, the ongoing evaluation and and I think, you know, piloting when possible before adding some of those those stakes to make sure that kinks are worked out to make sure that it's a as fair as possible system but i think you know you're you're as andrew is saying you know teachers are going to feel feel some pressure regardless and so finding that that balance and trying to you know mitigate so the kids are are the the children are you know not not affected by by that as much as possible um, i think comes down to that that stakes issue Let's go to another question. Um, I see a hand up in the back, the man with the um, green checked shirt. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Teddy Hartman. I am a, a education pioneer graduate fellow at the moment. I was a teacher for a decade and now I'm doing uh, ed policy work at the University of Maryland. Um, so my question is looking at the kind of um, the risks that it's resource intensive and that teachers and principals might not have the training. I'm wondering if there's any kind of work to be done with by state by state with teacher credentialing programs um, or as kind of teachers are coming out getting their certificate or graduate degree, um, whether we can shift some of that so that part of that would be learning how to kind of norm these SLOs and kind of having some of that training so it's not just school site specific but kind of state by state so that there's some of that kind of burden as you're saying shifted um, somewhere else in the system so that kind of coming out with the credential um, teachers could be a little better qualified for some of these things. So yeah, I know that for sure Laura will want to comment on that. It's uh, something she's been doing some work on writing about. But do, uh, any of you want to jump in first on uh, the no, question? I, I would just say that we're, we're trying to work at the chief state school officers with a group of states on kind of doing a variety of things to improve the pipeline for improving educator effectiveness and looking particularly at levers that um, states have a particular role in, including how to set up better certification standards for entering teachers, um, program approval for teacher education programs, and better data to be able to track um, what happens to graduates of different um, teacher prep programs. But, but I think the the example that you that you touched on in particular of doing a better job in teacher preparation programs around the whole issue of of assessment literacy, you know, how to understand the purposes and limits of different assessment tools and how to use assessment data in a diagnostic way, um, all would be terrific um, kind of priorities um, for improvement. So I thought you made a great point. We, we, we do a lot of work looking at, at teacher preparation programs. Um, we released our teacher prep review uh, in, in June. And th there's a real disconnect between um, what programs do and, and you know, what the, what the Date has put in place for, for what's going to be, um, you know, the requirements in the classrooms. And, and it's a disconnect. I, I really personally, in fact, Laura and I were talking about this right before we started, right? There's this disconnect between um, the idea of academic freedom on, on the one hand, and but you're a teacher preparation program on, on the other hand, right? You, you, you've asked to be a teacher preparer in the state, and there are a set of requirements uh, that, that go with that. I, I think you, you're exactly right. You know, what if, if a state has a, a model evaluation system in place, wouldn't it behoove every program in the state to make sure that it's graduates are familiar with that program, but both on the observation side, on the SLO side, um, it, it just, it, it, it enhances the, the pipeline. It makes it so much easier for, for the candidates to make the transition into the classroom. But it's a really heavy push to get, um, to get programs to, to recognize that, that that is part of their responsibility. And I think through CCSSOs and, and other efforts, um, states are really getting ready to, to um, to be a little more demanding of, of programs, and, and it's to the benefit of, of the teachers and the kids, I really think. You know, the, the comments that I was going to make have already been said, so I, I would echo what's in set, been said and, and reiterate the, the communication point between, um, you know, what's really needed in the schools and what the state's required and what's actually happening in teacher 
preparation programs. In my um, a previous re- paper that that I did called Getting in Sync, you know, looked at um, you know early childhood preparation programs and elementary preparation programs, and just um, you know that they're not really meeting the the needs of, of what's what's in the you know students' classrooms or you know this this issue of assessment li- literacy or how to use data that they that they get every day on their on their their um, you know children and and use that in a way to to you know inform what they're going to do the next day it's just it's really not happening and to that point what the the comments the gentleman made earlier that were very salient around kind of what does this mean for those little kids um i'm almost wondering as well if within our teacher preparation programs there needs to be a sense of developmentally what it means to tell a five or six year old this test really matter you know if you want to kind of how to help <coughs> teachers understand how to communicate to their their young children in their classrooms without suddenly putting a kind of extra level of pressure on them that young kids at that age may not even fully understand I think that 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 issue of you know de- the developmental sciences is really missing from most Prep, teacher preparation programs, especially elementary, and when you think, you know, in in most states, there's teachers who could get an elementary li- license, which from elementary preparation, or an early childhood license, and still teach in K one and two. So I think you know, early childhood programs do a little bit better job with the developmental sciences and being able to to understand how children learn best in those grades and how to, um, y- you know talk to them about different issues so they don't feel you know all the the extra pressure coming down from them but it's really absent in the the elementary um, teacher preparation program so we we have teachers that um, you know are working with these young children but aren't necessarily um, understanding of the best ways that that they learn at those those young ages and so um, you know I think that's that's a huge concern area for improvement okay here on the on the right uh, gentleman in the Salmon colored shirt. Did uh, my colors right yeah. today? <laughs> You're doing a good job. <laughs> Fellow Can as you well. speak up just a little bit? My yeah. name is William Jackson. I'm an Education Pioneers Fellow as well. Um, and so my question, I guess, is two parts, but I'll try to make it really brief. Uh, in terms of switching, I think Mr. Quigley, you said something uh, earlier about target versus growth goals. And so like how the conversation is changed to be more about growth Mm -hmm. of this particular teacher. And so does that help kind of ease some of these pressures that teachers feel that they don't have to be at a certain target, but they're judged on how much they grow? You Um, mean the teachers, how much the students in their classroom are growing? Or do you mean also teacher growth? When I said it, I meant the students' growth. Yeah. And and so I, I mean moving that idea to when we assess teachers, we're talking about teachers' growth. So mm-hmm. this is where you were at the beginning of the year, and this is where you were at the end of the year. And you've taken these steps to get here. And so this is how we're going to assess you, as opposed to, oh, I'm at this target point, and so now I'm good. Or I'm not at this point, and so I'm a bad teacher. And so how does this kind of become a more formative conversation? And so people are pushed to want to be better and not just to be at a certain point. And then I think... Um, The second part is, is how do we hold these administrators accountable for the teacher's growth? Because you're continuously putting this pressure on the teachers and the students to perform, but then at the end of the day, the administrators are just sitting there like, oh, well, you know, I'm doing the best that I can, and nobody, so how do you hold these people accountable for trying to (coughs) develop these teachers, and how does this kind of all fit in with the SLO thing? So there's a lot in this in this question. Thank you for that. Um, I I would love to hear also, um, Kate, on the impact the the principal piece of it, perhaps. But but do you want to go ahead, Andrew, and respond? Well, to some I'll, of that? I'll respond to the second part of it. Um, I had a I had a target, as the the te- teachers each had a target. I had a target too. So I had a target in terms of I had a target in terms of the the number of students in the building that had to be above grade level that at the beginning of the year and at the end of the year so it was not just the teachers that had a growth target repercussion what was on the line for you the repercussion was it had to do with your evaluation rating and did that lead to salary adjustments i'm just Um, kind of curious what the stakes are i know that a lot of principals feel this in 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 a well in illinois principals are not tenured so you could, in fact, lose your job. 
Um, the way our the way our contract was written is if you get a, a certain number of unsatisfactories in a row, you you could be fired. So so yeah, um, a personnel decision could be made on that. Um, the the first comment, the first question, I don't know that I'm that I'm the one to answer, but but the second one, yeah, I had a goal too. Well, in terms of the school administrator evaluation and how they're held accountable, school administrators in D.C. are evaluated under impact as well. Uh, they have a their impact looks slightly different from the staff impact. Uh, there are two main components. Um, one is around D.C. CAS, our standardized assessment, and hitting goals that they've set with the chancellor at the beginning of the year for uh, for the DC CAS. And then the other part is around what we call the leadership framework. And so that's six core standards, instruction, um, school culture, but then particularly talent management. Um, so whether or not they're retaining their highest performing staff, and fortunately through impact, we're able to identify our highest performing staff members. So we know who it is that those principals are, are targeting for particular retention. Um, and, and so a few other things go into talent management, but principals are held accountable through through uh, goals and the leadership framework. Um, and uh, ultimately, we have a performance-based pay system for our school leaders, and they are subject to separation. They're also um, at will. Uh, that was the term I was looking for. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so they're also at will, uh, but their evaluation is a part of the chancellor's decision as to whether or not to renew contracts. Um, in terms of, of the evaluation system being a growth measure for teachers, um, we certainly hear that from teachers. We've heard from teachers that since Impact, this is the first time that they've actually had observations and real conversations about their teaching uh, from their administrator. And then we also, as part of Impact, have what we call master educators. So they're an outside, objective, third-party content area expert. And they receive two observations from those folks over the course of the year. And we hear regularly that it's the most robust feedback they've ever received in their entire career. So that actually really is helping them grow. We also see, uh, we're, we're able to see the teachers who are moving across the ratings category. And we're seeing that uh, a large number of our teachers who were rated um, in one of our lower categories minimally effective move to effective, that it actually is they're getting feedback that is helping them to improve their practice and move into the effective category. And that actually, uh, it, it can be something of a catalyst to help prompt them to reach out and to get some of those supports. So it certainly is a, 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 an improvement mechanism for teachers. Let's take um, just a couple more questions, and then we will wrap it up. There's, um, I, I know what we'll do. Let's do kind of a, a, a rapid fire round. I'll take two questions together, and then we'll answer those together, and Ooh. I'll take two more together, and we'll answer those together, and then we'll have some Hold closing remarks. Two questions at once. I know. <laughs> Mixing it up. I'm Kara Jackson. Um, like Teddy, I'm also a doctoral candidate at Maryland, and I'm about to become the Assistant Director of Accountability for the Urban Teacher Center. Um, and so my, one of my questions for you is, all of this teacher evaluation reform is sort of coming down the same pike at the same time at the Common Core Standard. So are you aware of people working to sort of create these student learning objecti objectives with the Common Core Standards in mind, with the idea in mind that you could maybe have economies of scale where states are sharing their um, SLOs so they can kind of combine information. Good. Okay. Things. So we have a common core alignment question. And yes, go ahead. If you can grab the microphone and introduce yourself. That was my exact question. <laughs> hey, hey, let me do that. All right. Let's, yeah, let's grapple with this one in terms of that kind of connection and that knowing, of course, that with the common core standards also come in the common core assessments that would be testing those standards and how they'd be used um, in the early grades, which are reaching down younger than third. Um, who wants to jump in on that? Or I know, Laura, this is something, if you want to just give some of the, the factual Well, I know that, um, you know, the states that are implementing Common Core, the, the standards are guiding, you know, the, the um, S SLOs. But um, as far as to, to the second point about states working together around a, developing Common, I don't, I'm not. I haven't heard that. I yeah. Wish I yeah, I wish I did too. I don't. I mean, I would just throw in quickly that there's a really good paper by a guy at Aspen Institute on the importance of kind of tying these initiatives together um, that, you know, would be worth looking at. I've got a copy with me if you want the, I don't, can't remember his name. But also, I think there's some real technical issues around the timing of introducing the new assessments that are key to the common core and then, you know, 
when that data comes into play in terms of cycles of teacher evaluation and you know are you going to be using kind of tests based on the old standards to you know render consequences to teachers and sorting that out i think it's led in some ways to kind of the the desire to kind of put off you know delay the onset of of these initiatives or put off high stakes consequences and the extent to which that could be done so that you're really lining up the you know impetus to promote the common core with the incentives for teachers and not have things get crosswise have you I and mean, maybe Laura this is something you've encountered as well but has there been any case where a, a district or even a, a a school deciding on SOLs has said, well, we're going to do this as an interim measure until we get the Common Core assessment, and then we'll use those as our, or, or we'll somehow create SLOs out of those, or has well, that come up? The I mean, the assessments that are coming online aren't necessarily, like, as far as the, the standardized, um, you know, part of the state systems aren't reaching down into the to the early grades. I mean, I think it was Park that was looking at um, creating some formative kinds of assessments for teachers to use in the early grades, but I believe that they've put that on hold. So that's okay. even, even more um, delayed now. But I think, I mean, the only, there are some interim kinds of things, like we'll use this until until we, like Florida, for example, a lot of the districts are using that shared attribution approach until assessments are created for um, every grade and subject area. So that's sort of a place that it's being interim. I think there's also a lot of places, like we heard earlier, um, that are using an SLO type model for all teachers, um, even those in the tested mm -hmm. subjects, but it just counts more you know, in the, in the early grades. So. And okay. DC. Also. So two more. Um, we'll take them together. Um, here in the front, these two folks, um, Albert, uh, or yeah, the woman in the Hi. front, and then Albert. Thanks. Um, I'm Ann O'Brien. I'm with the Learning First Alliance, and my um, you know area of expertise is not in early childhood. So I'm kind of trying to to wrap my mind around some of the things that are being discussed here. Um, I'm curious as to whether there has been a lot of pushback in places where these types of mm, especially standardized uh, systems of evaluating, um, especially the pre-K um, and kindergarten students. Um, pushback from parents, uh, in especially middle and upper class parents, um, and their views on kind of this, this whole trend of evaluating these younger age teachers using student achievement data. Um, and then I'm also wondering as particularly maybe regards um, a literacy test for for early grade students, how developmental issues are, child development issues are, are taken into consideration because it's my understanding from my limited knowledge of the research that there's so much developmental difference among kindergartners, among first graders, you know, among second graders, that it really isn't until you hit the third grade that you can kind of start separating out some of those those characteristics. So, um, great. If you okay. could just talk about that. Excellent. So so. That's actually very related to what I was going to ask. Um, it's sort of the, another elephant in the room <laughs> that I think the only thing we've talked about. So if this is a really big room <laughs> for two elephants at least. So, <laughs> Laura, um, in her paper, talked about the unique attributes of pre-K to third students and the way that in which they learn and demonstrate the learning. And so the underlying assumption assumption of all this is that you can actually reliably measure growth in kindergarten, first grade, preschoolers in a way that um, you can tie high stakes to it. Um, you know, I'm all, you know, student learning outcomes is, sounds great in terms of like really a, could provide rich um, PD, professional development opportunities, but we haven't really talked about sort of the underlying assumption that this is, we can get reliable and valid data that can, we can then tie high stakes to teacher evaluation. So. So we'd love to, for the panel to right. address that. Okay, thank you. So I'm just gonna, so to reiterate those three questions and given our time, I'm also gonna ask our panelists to, if you wanna make a closing statement as well within your, your answer, please do. So we have a question about has there been parent pushback in anything that you've seen around this? Um, do we know developmentally as children are progressing from say five to six years old to seven and eight, um, is it, can we in fact kind of, uh, measure 
their their growth and it kind of pertains to what uh, Albert uh, from National Governors Association thank you Albert for be, for being here um, Albert Watt had asked about in terms of just validity um, and reliability of the assessments that are being used in the younger grades in the first place so let's do this I'm going to actually um, put you on the spot Tom I'm going to start with you and go all the way down and then have Laura um, close us close us out so I'll try I'll I'll address Albert's question which I think is a is a killer question, and it's this is a, such a tough issue because I think my perspective, as I said earlier, is I think this is the direction that we're moving in. I don't think we're going to go back. I think the technical issues, even with older kids, um, m many of uh, most of the best methodologists are pretty dubious about the value added um, method in terms of can you reliably identify these kind of outstanding or um, real, you know, lower performers? Um, or do the scores bounce around for factors that are not related so much to the teacher effectiveness? And I, it's like, it, it seems like the verdict from people who are very serious about this stuff and know a lot more about tests than I do is this, this doesn't work. I, it just feels like th we're moving in this direction in spite of that huge elephant <laughs> and I think for younger kids where we have less of we have less experience technically with large-scale assessment um, and measuring growth they're probably more serious problems so it's it's a huge dilemma <laughs> thanks for raising that <laughs> I'll, I'll hit the parent one I think that it's really important to explain that uh, bless you <laughs> bless you um, I think it's really important to note that if a school is using the data that they have appropriately, they're using it to make instructional decisions. And so the amount of data that comes in shouldn't just be for SLOs or for teacher evaluation. It should be for instructional decision making. And when that's explained to parents in, in a manner that, 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 that is real to them, that they can see, Here's a data chart. Here's a dashboard with, you know, unidentified. Here's how I start grouping children. Here's how I start planning for instruction. Then the amount of assessment, it doesn't become an assessment anymore. It becomes part of instruction. And so then there's less pushback because they understand that it's, that it's every day and it's used every day. Um, and I think that just in closing, I'd like to say that, that I, I fully agree with um, one of Laura's points near the end of the paper is that whatever happens, that it needs to be aligned. It needs to be aligned from the earliest grades through the later grades, all grades, you know, pre-kindergarten, even, even if we're going to start assessing, you know, the early childhood teachers zero to three, needs to be aligned and it needs to be for all of the subjects, not just reading and math. And, and I thank you for that wonderful paper. Um, so just one, the only um, place I'm aware of um, with parent pushback, and it wasn't around um, student achievement, in Georgia where they had planned under their Race to the Top grant to include student surveys as a counted part of um, teacher evaluation at the K-2 level, parents really just couldn't wrap their heads around that, how their five-year-olds were going to circle a smiley face or a frowny face and that that was going to be part of um, you know, a, a teacher's rating. Um, teachers didn't, weren't too crazy about it either, but but the parents really didn't like it, and and they ultimately dropped it and have had some um, uh, interesting fallout with the feds over that being because it was part of part of their plan. Um, I, I'm not sure to what extent. I mean, like we we all kind of think like, yeah, that's that's kind of a hard sell, um, but I'm not sure it was well communicated. You know, student surveys in general are are not. What, what first pops into most people's head, which is, you know, do you like this teacher when, when they first hear about it? So um, that, that there may have been more communication. Um, I, I, I think to, to the other question about, you know, how are we making sure this is valid for, for, um, for the early grades, you know, this is where really our emphasis on growth is, is really our, our friend, right? We're, we're not saying did every kid get to this 
proficiency level, which, um, you know, so a kid might get to in kindergarten or might get to in first grade, and there's really not a developmental problem at all. It's just, or, or a learning problem. It's just, you know, kids are, are different at, at those ages. Um, but, but you know, what what do we want to make sure is happening in this classroom, and, and how are we going to, to be able to get at it, I think, are important questions to ask, and we have to um, keep that in balance with, with making sure that our measures are, are fair and accurate. And, and I think these grades are, are going to continue to, to be a challenge. Challenge. At the same time, we, we can't risk saying, nah, kindergarten, first grade, what will happen will happen, and you know, <laughs> we'll, we'll sort it out later on, which I actually think is the, is the uh, plan in, in, in many schools. Um, at at the, the school uh, that I taught in in Brooklyn, um, you know, we had a principal for a while who tried to lure the best early childhood teachers to the tested grades and, and placed the, um, you know, the teacher she saw as really weak into kindergarten and first grade where, you know, they can't cause any problem when, uh, really? <laughs> so, um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's how it all fits together into the whole equation. Um, <clears throat> I would say, uh, in terms of the reliable data or valid data or how child development plays into this, um, my gut reaction to that is that this is a complicated issue and there's a lot of really critical professional judgment on the part of a school leader and on the part of a teacher um, and to trust that they really are instructional experts and that they have the content knowledge and the background to make smart decisions around goal setting in the beginning and then reviewing the data at the end. So if we had a situation where perhaps a child had a traumatic event happen over the course of the year, which would impact then potentially the, the uh, their score at the end of the year. We've had teachers who call and explain the situation and we ask, we ask them and we talk with their administrators to have a conversation about that as they are looking at the data at the end of the year and take that into consideration. Use your professional judgment. Um, and, and that's okay. That, that actually works and I think is a really strong, uh, a strong outcome that people are having real meaningful conversations around this data and around the assessments. I just add that I think that the the point or the, the little anecdote that um, you know Sandy mentioned is is really important here. And you know I was a former teacher and experienced had some of the same kinds of things happening in in my school, and I've heard that from other teachers that the the you know teachers that aren't you know getting the scores in the older grades that the principal wants are moved down you know into kindergarten and first grade. And so we need strong teachers everywhere, and we especially need um, you know highly effective teachers in the early grades to really set kids on the on the right path and getting that that right start but this the issue that that Albert raises is 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 really a huge one and I think you know it's it's also why the focus on multiple measures is important and so this question of you know what weight do we put on these these different components you know um, observation is 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 an important piece also and and you know finding ways to um, I know in in Lisa's paper watching teachers work you know talks about different um, tools that really look closely at teachers interactions with students which we know matter so so much and you know the the kind of language and conversations they're having with st with students and so I think you know the more that we can look at those kinds of things and then also how you know it's important to really examine or, you know, observe how teachers are using the data that they're getting from any kind of assessment, you know, whether it's the ones that they're doing every day and, in you know, the, the formative ones they're using every day by just asking their, their students questions and, and seeing what, they, what they've learned or didn't learn from previous lessons. I mean, how teachers are using that information is an important, um, you know, piece as well. So I think it's, it's a question of, of balance. Um, and so that's, that's what we really need to, to think about and, and look at, I think, and that's to answer the question posed earlier. I think that's really where the debate's going to go um, next. So thank you to everybody up here. Um, please join me in giving everyone a warm round of applause for time. So the paper is outside.